The woman didn't speak after that quiet whisper, but she did walk with Red back to her room. Red carried the sandwich in one hand and held the woman's hand with her other hand. The woman was definitely confused, but she seemed to want to stay with the Red Prince. But any attempts to communicate at first seemed to be less than helpful. Latin, Nahuatl, Imperial Sign Language, or ISL, only drew a blank stares. And before Red could try Astorian, something deep in her heart told her that was a terrible idea. So she stuck with the common creole of the Imperial cities, which at least drew recognition from the woman's eyes. Now at the cottage, Red stepped over the line of white sand and the woman followed. The woman seemed to understand that the line of white sand wasn't supposed to be disturbed, so she likely knew what was happening. Fallen Grace! I'm back. Fallen Grace flew by hearing that, and seeing the woman, Fallen Grace sighed. Did you remember to get dinner? Well, I found a woman I needed to bring back to the cottage. Mark, not again. I told you to text me if you are going to bring over company so I could leave. Red's cheeks and ears turned hot as she responded. Not in that way. Crystal said there was no one else on the entire island, and yet I was able to find her in the kitchen. But before that, she found me in the library where I found another card. The woman stared at Fallen Grace and she reached out a hand like she was unsure if the fairy was real or fake. She was paying a lot more attention to the fairy than to the words said by Red Prince. Her fingers dangled near where Fallen Grace was hovering as she reached out, only for Fallen Grace to, fall, to fly out of reach with practice acrobatics. Don't touch me, she warned the woman. And Red was very familiar that if Fallen Grace didn't want to be touched, someone was likely to lose part of their body. And a Luke? The woman rasped out. Fallen Grace hovered a foot in front of the woman's face and her hands dropped, fascinated by the floating fae. Ah, na dwin gad death ve? Fallen Grace responded in Kim Reg. While neither the Red Prince nor Marceline were fluent, she did understand that Fallen Grace said that she was a fairy. Looking at the way the woman understood Kim Reg and seemed more relaxed speaking to Fallen Grace than she did with Red Prince, it looked like the fall Fallen Grace could help the woman a lot more than Red could. Would you be more comfortable telling Fallen Grace what happened? She asked the woman. The woman looked at Red and then at Fallen Grace, only to look back at Red at whom she nodded at. Wait, what? Why me? Fallen Grace asked her sister. Look sis, if you want your sandwich, please do this for me. Fine, Fallen Grace said with a sigh as she began to speak with the woman, while Red ate her half of the sandwich. Despite Fallen Grace's small mass, she ate quite a bit, usually many more times than her body mass at least once a day. When Red Prince asked about it once, Fallen Grace said it was like being a hummingbird, where she was nearly constantly flying, so she needed a lot of calories to keep flying. It didn't explain where the food went, but Red figured that was as likely as an answer, as she didn't want to know any further. After nearly an hour of chatting with the woman, the woman asked to go to the restroom, and Fallen Grace flew over to Red and sighed before speaking. Well, it was hard to get anything out of her, but very complicated story made simple. She doesn't remember who she is, why she's here, nor what made her like this. What I did manage to figure out is she felt safest in the underground. Any idea how she got into the underground? The only way I found there was barred and gated? No, she just mentioned that the outpost hotel was designed by Johan Contriver Sr. So I am pretty certain it was one of his infamous secret paths, Fallen Grace said. Fuck, Red Prince said. Johann Contriver Sr. was an architect and serial killer who specialized in creating literally hostile architecture that was full of trapdoors, false paths, hidden tunnels, and impossible puzzles, all meant to either torture or kill unwanted guests. He had built over a dozen buildings under his name, and likely dozens more under pseudonyms. He had a very mo odd modus operandi. He insisted every trap had to have a way out, not just for him, 
but so that anyone who could think like him could escape. He was also exoteric in Tipicam as they came, so as odd as the traps and passages were, they were based in regular science, no magic, nor mad science. So that was definitely Cassandra's curse there, being aware of the threat, but not being able to do anything about it. And the final and most disturbing part about Johann Contriver's architecture was that the owners commissioned all of the hostility. Even though the engineer was eventually caught and in trouble, it didn't stop the fact that there were so many people who intentionally sought him out because they wanted what he could do done for them. Is there anything she said that might you might you think might be helpful? Well, she mentioned something about a tower to the south that was excavated but then abandoned quickly. Maybe start there? Thank you. Red said as she made her way to the restroom door, and she knocked on the bathroom door. It had been nearly ten minutes and she didn't hear anything. Are you alright? You've been in there for a while. When Red got no response, she knocked again and still no response. Now worried, she was now ready to do another five word test. But after her response to the Black Moon, she decided to do a different one. Rises as it falls. Red said to the door, and Fallen Grace, sitting from her place where she was eating, paused before answering herself. The economy! Fallen Grace responded, while Red listened closely to the door. Not hearing anything, she tried the door handle. Unlocked. The bathroom was pretty typical, except for the full-length mirror next to the sink, in addition to the typical mirror over the sink and two light bulbs in N-shaped sconces. Glancing over the bathroom to try to see where the woman could have possibly gone, her eyes fell back to the two sconces. They were shaped a bit oddly, where they looked more like the Latin letter N than a torch. If she was a serial killer with a love of wordplay and unique exits, that's where she would hide the switch. Enlighten. Red said as she grabbed the sconces and twisted them slightly. There was a loud click as the full-length mirror swung open to reveal a cold and dark tunnel. Glancing at the back of the mirror, she realized she could see through it easily. This wasn't a mirror, it was one-way glass that could have spied into the bathroom at any time. Do you want to help me find the woman? Red asked her sister, who sighed and flew over to sit on Red's shoulder. Do I have to? What do you want to say in a hotel room where you can be spied on without your knowledge? Fallen Grace sighed and waved, indicating it was all right. Red grabbed a flashlight and began to make her way down the tunnel. Sure enough, the mirror began to close behind her, sealing her into the tunnel that only led deeper into the dark and the ground. Red followed the tunnel for what felt like 20 minutes before it leveled out, as she followed it through. The tunnel, despite its age, was surprisingly dry and warm, but it made sense. She was likely underwater and underground at the same time, and if any part of it was leaking salt water, then the entire tunnel would have been flooded by now. The stone didn't tell who built it, but there were no turns or splits. At least not until she made it to a T-junction, with one side heading east and the other heading south. Pausing at the intersection, she thought about her choices. There was supposed to be an entrance to the underground to the south, and the tower she wanted to explore was also to the south. But to the east could be anything. Turning right, she followed the tunnel south. Here things got a bit different. Moss was starting to grow on the walls, and there was a dampness in the stones, and she could hear a distant drip. Water was getting into this part of the tunnel, and that could easily be a threat to her. The tunnel continued south and down some, until Red's flashlight flashed over the half-flooded tunnel ahead. The water was still and dark, with no way to see what was in it, if anything was in it. She was about to turn back until her flashlight flashed across something white on the other side. 
Sure enough, only 20 feet ahead there was a white shoe with something stick out, sticking out of it on the other side of the shore. The same shoe that the woman was wearing earlier. So she came this way. Red examined the water and sighed as she removed her jacket with her grimoire and got ready to carry it. She wasn't sure how deep the water was, but her jacket and grimoire weren't exactly very effective at being wet. You might want to fly ahead, Fallen Grace. I don't know if anything in the water, but let's be safe. Fallen Grace responded by flying forward and looking back at the Red Prince. She cared for her, and this was not something she was looking forward to. Stay safe, she warned her little sister. Putting the flashlight in her mouth, Red carefully waded through the water, holding the jacket and the grimoire above her head. It wasn't long until the water was up to her waist. Red felt every cell in her body go into overload trying to detect any danger. The chill sank into her bones while her mind thought of serpents swimming just beyond her feet waiting to bite her legs or of an octopus as large as a card table waiting to wrap its tentacles around her body and to pull her down too quickly for her to even scream. Or, even worse, monstrous things. Stay calm. Marceline whispered to Red while making it to the other shore. Sighing and putting on her jean jacket again, Red felt worse than naked without the jacket on herself. Even cold and wet, it felt so much better to have the jacket on. It saved her life so many times before, but sadly, things like that also needed just as much care as they gave. Is there anything ahead? Red asked. Well, I think there's some stairs leading down ahead and look out! Fallen Grace called out just before Red found her face in the dust tasting old stone and blood while something pulled on both her legs pulling into the water. She couldn't even see what was happening before she was pulled underneath and pulled far from the surface. Whatever was pulling her down was pulling her further and further as the surface was now a distant ripple growing ever smaller. Her lungs burned even as she kicked at what pulled to her with no effect. In her panicked thoughts at first, she wanted to use the esoteric energy in her fist to blast lightning through the water. But the fact that the electricity would just as easily kill her as the threat led her to try to think of something else that might work. She couldn't write in her grimoire underwater. She couldn't use the swarm switch without having somewhere to switch to. And she couldn't speak so she couldn't affect whatever it was. Now, so deep in the water that there was no difference between closing her eyes or keeping them open, and with her lungs burning like they were filled with molten steel, and her heart pounding in her ears like drums, and she knew that her consciousness would be going very soon. There had to be some way out, right? Still, even as she struggled, she only felt herself get deeper, and then a very clear thought came into her head. She was going to die here. Nothing she could do would change that. This thought didn't bring her panic, but it brought clarity to her. If she was going to die anyways, she would bring this creature down with her. Turning to face where she was being pulled to, the Red Prince balled her fist and thrust them both forward like she was trying to punch her invisible adversary. Her hands flashed with the electric esoteric energy, but instead of being blue like it normally was, the energy was crimson as freshly shed blood as it brought both light and energy to the water around her. When light was introduced by the red energy, she saw that she wasn't as deep as she thought. The only thing tangled around her leg was seaweed and the surface was only a few inches above her head. Standing up as quickly as she could, she gulped the air, her hands still flashing the red energy. What the hell? 
What was that? Falling Grace asked while Red dragged herself to the shore, tearing away the seaweed and flopping onto the shore, focusing on her breathing just for a few minutes before she finally spoke. What that was, was an illusion. It was very deliberately set up for me, trap me in a situation where I could fight back and where if I tried to fight back, I would have died. They probably weren't expecting me to do what I just did. What was that energy? I never saw anything like that from you. Red lifted her hand, remembering the feeling of the crimson energy. It was like holding a heart in your hand. A lot of incredible life-giving energy, but it was also so fragile that if she squeezed even lightly, it would have died. She had felt fire in her hands. That was like holding a balloon while it was expanding. And she had felt lightning within her hands, and that was like holding a swarm of mice all trying to escape her hand. Whatever that crimson energy was, it wasn't an element she was familiar with. Focusing the emotions she felt in that moment underwater, she flexed her fingers, feeling the tingle flow around her hands and fingers, but this time the energy was blue and electric and familiar. I don't know, we'll probably have to look into that more when we get home. Dragging herself to her feet, Red saw that indeed just 10 feet ahead of her, there was a metal stairway that led down to the deep dark, grabbing the flashlight, which by some miracle still worked. Are you sure about this? You were hurt and I haven't seen you hurt like that in a long time. Red lifted her finger to her lips where she bit herself when she fell. Removing it with some fresh blood, Red nodded. If I don't try to stop this, it'll keep happening. And you know I won't allow that. That is not my nature. Fallen Grace sighed and dusted herself off as she flew just ahead of Red, instinctively worried about her sister. And you tell everyone you're not a hero. Um... The Red Prince was a lot of things. She was proud of her work, she enjoyed helping others, and something inside of her pushed her to keep helping others. But even with the blessing of those like Adansi and the Baron, she did not want to take that title. There was too much darkness in her past for her to, her to call herself a shield for others. Brushing off her wet grimoire, she could see that her own personal sigil was peeling off of the leather cover, revealing just beneath that there was a golden crown within a red heater, a shield shape, a symbol of a hero, something that Red wasn't willing to accept, and she kept covering it up. Still though, she kept her grimoire close to her heart as both her and her sister walked down those shaky steps into a dark unknown.